Welcome back, this is Dr. Jen Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. The five benefits of fasting on the gut microbiome. Before I get started, I'm excited to announce that our educational modules on diet, lifestyle, and nutrition has launched. It is currently active. There will be a discount for those people who sign up by August 26th. After that, prices will go up. These educational modules include um, topics like hypothyroid, uh, autoimmune disease, GI dysfunction, etc. Now, there will also be a message board in there and weekly Q and A's. We'll also do interviews with industry experts to figure out what's going on with your health. So let's get back to the regular video. So five benefits. Increase microbiome diversity when you fast. And the way that occurs is there's a reduction in nutrients allowing the less dominant bacteria to proliferate and grow, increasing the diversity. There's a promotion of beneficial bacteria when you fast. And the way that happens is there's an increase in short chain fatty acids, increase in anti-inflammatory effects, improved barrier function, things like leaky gut or dysbiosis. So the change in gut motility and change in pH is what helps the beneficial bacteria. So gut motility will change obviously because you're not eating, but the pH of your stomach will go down. Okay. Oftentimes people don't realize that uh, when you have reflux problems, it's not too much acid for most people, it's too little acid. You need acid to break down your fats, proteins, carbohydrates. It also helps signal the enzymes to help break those um, fats, carbohydrates, and protein, right? So a proper pH in the stomach is necessary. It alters bile metabolism. So bile is produced through the liver and is stored in the gallbladder and it will contract as necessary to digest fats. Now, when you have uh, lack of food, your, bile, your gallbladder will not contract. It will just store the bile. Now bile has like antimicrobial effects. So it gives it a, your gut microbiome a break from the antimicrobial properties of bile. So it gives it a favorable, favorable condition for the gut microbiome to grow. Only caveat to this is that if you have gallbladder problems to start with, if you have gallstones, sludge, ga sludge in the gallbladder, gallbladder attacks, hypothyroid where your gallbladder may not contract very well, or you have just problems digesting fats in general, uh, you want to be cautious because bile gets stored in the gallbladder and you have a higher propensity for things like gallstones. So you just got to be careful. And that's why when you say, I say, if you're going to do a prolonged fast, you should be monitored. And it's important that you do that, okay? Now, the third benefit, there's a reduction in pathogenic bacteria. Basically, it creates a more challenging environment for the pathogenic bacteria to grow, okay? Number four, it enhances gut barrier function. And the way it does that is it increases short chain fatty acids, increase beneficial bacteria, and decrease in pathogenic bacteria. Basically, you give it an environment to strengthen the gut barrier. So it helps with things like dysbiosis, leaky gut, or intestinal permeability. The last thing is it modulates the immune system. If you give your body a break from eating, just the process of eating and, and digesting increases what we call reactive oxygen species. So if you give your body a break, it'll decrease reactive oxygen species, decrease inflammation overall, favoring the beneficial bacteria and short chain fatty acids and gut barrier function. You have to re also remember that modulating the immune system, how the microbiome uh, speaks to the enteric nervous system and how the enteric nervous system speaks to the brain. That's the gut brain axis where they communicate back and forth. So if a bad brain, you might have a bad gut. If you have a bad gut, you have a bad brain. Meaning, let's say you have a lot of digestive issues. Oftentimes these patients come in and they have brain fog or cognitive difficulties. It's because of that crosstalk between gut and brain, brain and gut. So it's important to look at this. 
Now, the next question people are going to ask me is, you know, what is the exact time frame that I should fast? And there is none. So there's intermittent fasting where e you're eating in a short period of a uh, short window, and then you have prolonged fast, which can go up to three to five days. Anything beyond one or two days, you need to be monitored. And your gut microbiome is different from everyone else's. So we can't give you like a specific time frame. A safe period would probably be a 16 and eight. You eat in an eight hour window, and you do that for two or three weeks and see how you feel, right? And then maybe you can go to a 618, eating a six hour window, right? And then you can maybe try to do a one day fast, but you need to kind of build up to it. And again, there is no exact uh, fasting method that's gonna work for one individual versus another. You also have to be careful if you're hypoglycemic and you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding and those types of things. So just be smart about how you're going to do it. Um, everyone is an individual, but fasting can have benefits on the gut microbiome. Fasting, parasites. Parasite life cycle may be interrupted by fasting. So if you don't eat for a certain period of time, the nutrient deficiencies may disrupt the life cycle of a parasite. So from egg, larva, all the way to the adult stages, the nutrient deficiency may impact them. Now, there is a caveat though. You may put the parasite into a dormant stage where they go into hiding and they're you know, dormant, like hibernating, and they become a little bit harder to kill later on. Short-term fasting, meaning one to three days, may boost the immune system may impact the gut microbiome and resetting the gut microbiome, also resetting insulin, which would help your immune system. So a short-term fast may boost your immune system, helping to fight parasitic infections. Autophagy and parasite clearance. So when you do the fast, after about the 17th or 20th hour, you start going into further autophagy. When this happens, you're cleaning out damaged components and intracellular parasites. So fasting, I think at the peak level of autophagy is probably gonna be around the second and third day, okay? Starvation and parasite resilience. So can survive nutrient scarcity. Some parasites will take the opportunity where you can't they can't get the nutrients that they need, and they will start to feed on the host tissue, meaning you. So there is a problem sometimes where if you go into too long of a fast, that it will actually improve the uh, parasitic resiliency, and they will start to uh, feed off the host. Fasting helps with detoxification and parasite elimination. So fasting gives the digestive system a break, right? So when you eat foods, natural processes occur and you actually get what we call reactive oxygen species or ROS. So just giving your body a break from processing all the food proteins, it allows your body to focus on clearing toxins and parasites out of our system. Combining the fasting with complementary therapies. I think this is where you need to be. So fasting um, can be beneficial in terms of helping the parasitic cleanse portion of it. However, you may be limited in terms of trying to get completely getting rid of the parasites because some parasites are more resilient than others. So what do we need to do? You wanna combine the fasting along with complementary therapies. Things like herbal remedies that are antimicrobial or antiparasitic. You can do saunas. You can do pulse magnetic frequencies that may disrupt uh, these parasitic infections. You can also do laser applications. So complementary and alternative therapies should be combined with the fasting to get the best possible results. So fasting can be one day, 
it can be up to three days. I would caution against going further than three to five days of fasting because you need the nutrients also and you need to build resilience and build your immune system. So going for too long or into starvation mode may be detrimental to you. So combining short-term fasting, meaning one to three days, along with complementary medicine with herbs, where you can rotate different types of herbs or combine them, and you can make an impact on clearing the parasitic infections. So there is a potential risk to the host due to the weakening of the immune system and lack of nutrients. So you don't want to go beyond um, um, your physiological um, resilience. So some people come in and they're very sick to start with. For those patients, you might want to just build resilience first before you try to kill anything off. So some people are good, they just have a GI infection, but they're relatively healthy, their immune system is still robust enough, then you may incorporate fasting along with natural herbal remedies. Or if the patient can get a hold of antiparasitic medications, certainly they can do that. But is fasting the end all to killing off parasites? No. Can you combine fasting with other complementary medicine or herbal remedies? Yes, I think that's probably the best strategy that you can take in order to get rid of parasitic infections. Fasting improves glutathione. Glutathione is a very important antioxidant system and is necessary in our body. It takes the blunt of the oxidative stress and it is very important for our overall health. So basically, fasting reduces oxidative stress by decreasing reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species occurs all the time, but when you eat, especially with processed foods or chemically laden foods or foods that you're allergic to, it creates more oxygen, reactive oxygen species. So, Fasting itself will reduce oxidative stress and basically decrease glutathione consumption. So it's preserving the glutathione reserves. Number two, fasting creates an activation of NRF2 pathways. This enhances the body's ability to increase glutathione and recycle glutathione. So it just doesn't help produce it, helps recycle glutathione. Number three, increases autophagy, the process of uh, removing dysfunctional cells and di dysfunctional mitochondria. So it recycles cell components and is less burdened to the glutathione system. Number four, improves mitochondrial function. Health of the mitochondria requires less glutathione. What that means is the healthier your cells are, the healthier your mitochondria are, there is less need for glutathione preserving its reserves. Number five, improves glutathione synthesis by upregulating an enzyme called glutamate cysteine ligase. Basically, it helps to improve glutathione production because this is a rate limiting step in the production of glutathione improves insulin sensitivity and conserves glutathione. As you know, if you have prediabetes and diabetes, it creates more oxidative stress to our system. So by improving insulin sensitivity by fasting, you are preserving your glutathione reserves. Number seven, detoxification. More efficient process of detoxification leads to more effective use of glutathione also increase the production as well as recycling of the glutathione. So it's important to understand that glutathione is a very, very important antioxidant in our, in our system. Your body has the ability to recycle it if given the nutrients. You can also take glutathione like liposomal glutathione or acetyl forms of glutathione. You can even nebulize it. You can use a liposomal cream. There's a variety of different ways to deliver glutathione. The seven amazing benefits of fasting on the brain. Now, there are different types of fasting, such as intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting. 
Intermittent fasting is where you're eating in a short period of time, about eight hours, six hours, or four hours, or some people will do what we call OMED, one meal a day. So you're basically eating in a very short period or short window of time. Prolonged fasting can be one day, two days, three days, up to five days. Anything up beyond one day, you really want to do a supervised fast so you don't get into trouble. So let's get into the amazing benefits of fasting specifically for the brain. Now, one, it stimulates autophagy and mitophagy. What this means is it clears damaged cells, protein aggregates, things like tau, amyloid, and alpha-synuclein, which are associated with Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's disease. It also helps to clear primed glial cells. Glial cells are what we call glue or immune cells of the brain and it has a, a big impact on how the brain functions. Now, when it gets primed because you have either abnormal amounts of stress, a concussion, or a chemical insult that impacts the brain, and these glial cells become activated or primed. When it becomes primed, basically it overreacts to stimulus. It can be just a light, or it could be a sound, and your body will fall apart. So it helps to clear out the prime glial cells. By this clearance process, it basically helps to maintain homeostasis, balance of mitochondria and the cells, okay? It also helps improve insulin sensitivity. Prediabetes and diabetes is, is pretty rampant here in the United States. So being able to improve insulin sensitivity at the cell site helps reduce the incidence of insulin resistance and diabetes. Glucose dysregulation impacts the brain by increasing uh, inflammation, also impacts the gut microbiome, which also impacts the brain. So there's multifold layers of how insulin impacts our brain. It's also effective in preventing or delaying dementia. Basically, it helps to remove dysfunctional mitochondria. Basically, mitochondria is what produces ATP, or the energy of the cell. Improves synaptic efficiency by improving energy overall. Number four, repressed mTOR, or mammalian target of rapamycin. It's a key regulator in cell growth and inhibits protein aggregation and increases autophagy. Basically, those tau and alpha-synuclein aggregates, it helps to decrease that, as well as increase the clearance, so the autophagy. Number five, stimulates AMPK, regulates energy homeostasis by controlling the uptake of glucose and fatty acids into the cell. Things like berberine, omega-3, and resveratrol have been known to stimulate AMPK. It also increases brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, supports neuronal health and growth, and improves synaptic connections. So the ability of these neurons to connect and talk to each other is enhanced with BDNF. It also improves mitochondrial biogenesis, basically helps to build new mitochondria. So you think about it, autophagy, mitophagy, clearance of these cells. So your body is stimulated to improve mitochondrial function by increasing biogenesis of the mitochondria. It builds better resilience against neuronal damage because you have better energy and better functioning cells. Now, Let's make it clear, all these processes occur every day, all day. Fasting enhances the process. So fasting will improve overall brain function, and there's other metabolic factors that we'll go into in our next video, but there, these are the seven benefits that impact the brain. My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.